Hey everybody, Mo Buttle here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Today, today I'm joined by Linda Klein. She's she's one of the people I aspire to be on an extremely short list of people that I, that I look up to, to the level that I look up to Linda. She's not only senior managing shareholder at, at Baker Donaldson, a very large law firm, um, she's a legend in law. Every About every single award you could get in law, she's got at Chambers, everything else. But but I think more more importantly for me, as the, as the father of two daughters, she was the first female president of the of the Georgia Bar. She was president of the National ABA, the American Bar Association. The number of trailblazing things Linda has done in her career boggles my mind. And in this particular episode, we dig deep into the genesis of all that, the moment that Linda learned that that growth is great, that relationship development, business development is something that, that she wanted to, to lean into to become great at. And if you're interested in like how she approaches relationship, how she thinks of bonding with people and, and adding value, stick around to the end of this episode because we dig deep into how Linda thinks about commonality and and approaches initial conversations. Really cool stuff. Let's get straight to it. This episode is so good. The four after it are as good or maybe even better. It's so good to watch this in a series. I can't, I, I don't want to wait anymore. Let's dive in right now. Here's Linda Klein. Hey everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm smiling from ear to ear because I've got one of the folks that I look up to immensely here for you on the show today. Her name's Linda Klein. She's she is a senior managing shareholder at Baker Donaldson. She's past president of the ABA, world, you know, countrywide. She was the first woman president of the Georgia Bar. Linda, I look up to you as the person where when people say to me, "I don't know how you do so much." You're the person in my mind, I think, well, I do half of what Linda Klein does. So I, I'm just so thrilled to have you on the show. I'm so thrilled to introduce you to our platform and all the people who can learn from you. Um, so first question, first episode, right out of the gate. You are so great. And I look up to you for because you're so great at seeing a change that needs to happen in the world with a client, with a group with a cause, with the ABA, whatever, and then you create growth. You create growth opportunities for other people. When was the moment you realized that growth was great, that being a change agent, a positive change in the world is something that you wanted to, that you wanted to do? The, the answer may be oh, not as exciting uh, as, as you were expecting because I, I take the words building a relationship and business development, and I separate them. First, business development. Uh, as a 23-year-old young lawyer, I was assigned a small case for a client in the moving and storage business. And I took the job very seriously, and I did the very best I could do. Uh, the clients were 30 years my senior, maybe more. And I talked to them frequently about their case. I went to their office. I went to their warehouse. And soon, I was the only lawyer that the clients would talk to. They wouldn't talk to the bosses anymore. And the client said, well, we always had to go to the lawyer's office. No lawyer took the time to come see me or to see their facility and learn how they do business. No lawyer paid attention to them and no lawyer listened as far as they felt. So at the time, I didn't know I was doing business development. And as far as I knew, I was just doing my job. So I guess the first point is when you're starting your career, you do your best and the rest will come. But specifically, I took the time to go to their office rather than sit in my own. I took the time to learn their business. And that lesson stayed with me my entire career. It's so rich and so good. And I remember we were at lunch once and I might, I might paraphrase this wrong, so I want you to correct me. But I think you said something like, being a good business person that happens to know a lot about law is really a powerful thing as opposed to only being a good lawyer. And does that, is that sort of where you're going by learning their business, showing up, showing them attention, showing them you cared enough to, to learn what the business was like, and then applying the law to the case you were working on? What are your thoughts? Yeah, exactly. It, it's not about developing the business. It's about developing the relationship. Uh, one of my retired partners made an absolute art 
of making his clients his personal friends. They'd play golf together. The spouses would play bridge and golf. And, and it was very, very impressive. And it worked so well for him. I don't think it works now, but that's, a, that's an example. But, you know, I, I just thought of something I'd like to share. Uh, it's, a, it's a part of my life that I just realized related to this context. Uh, when I was six years old, my grandpa Harry said, your grandmother and I were married in March of 29 and I opened my grocery store. Then he said, we had no idea of the depression that was to come. People were starving. And then he told me about the first form of welfare. Women were sent by the government to his store and they sat in the corner of his store and decided what the poor people were going to eat that week. He said, Linda Ann, that's awful. People should be able to choose what to feed their family. And he talked about the cultural differences around food and the immigrant community that he served. And he said that the ladies might decide that an Italian family was going to eat potatoes when they wanted pasta. And then he leaned forward and he said, sometimes when the ladies left, I exchanged the food. Now, my grandfather built a relationship with the community and he was helping his neighbors through a very tough time and they loved him for it. So while the longer version of this story is really about why I became a lawyer, the lesson I just realized it related to here for you is that the key to successful business development is relationship. Yeah. I, well, you know, of course, our system, and I could not uh, agree more. It's just so powerful. Well, let's get super practical. And one of the things I, I get feedback on the show is people like the concepts, they like the big ideas, but they also love just the sheer practicality of something they can put in place right away today. When you think about, so let's drill down on this idea because our audience is like, Diane, Linda, how do you do it? So when you think about, uh, let's drop everybody into like a first time meeting. Um, you've got an incredible network, somebody that knows you sends a CEO or, or there's some kind of matter you could work on. They, they introduce you to somebody. I bet this happens multiple times a day with you because you've, you've built such a, a powerful relationship base. So you meet somebody for the first time. First meeting, let's say it's on Zoom, it's over coffee or whatever. What are you looking to do in a first 30 minute meeting to start to build that relationship? I built an entire business development practice over being very involved in the community. Uh, I was the first one president of the state bar. I went on to be president of the American Bar Association, which I believe is the largest voluntary professional association in the world. Uh, but through my construction practice, I was involved in sustainable development before that was in vogue. I've been involved in nonprofits, diversifying corporate boards and diversifying corporate leadership. Uh, through my higher education practice, I became involved in health equity by getting to know medical schools. I work helping homeless veterans get access to justice. And there are many more that I'd love to talk about. But the point is, in telling you this, is along the way, I met people who shared my values, and we shared business relationships after that. And you mentioned that from my community service, I also built a big network of friends like you, who I can introduce to my clients when they cannot uh, solve when I cannot solve the problems that, that they have. So the, I guess my icebreaker is to talk about the things outside of the day-to-day -day business relationship that are important to them. And always there's a place to connect. Yeah. And you're so good at that. I've seen you in action in sessions, meeting people and things like that. I think what's interesting about that is so many of our clientele are high-end technical experts, not only lawyers, you know, like you, but high-end management consultants at some of the top management consulting firms in the world, architects, engineers, accountants, people, you know, I was an actuary. So people that have a really high technical uh, acumen and expertise, letters after their name to no end. And sometimes people can hesitate to go to that non-work conversation because they're like, well, I should only provide content to the person. I should only talk about the box that's in the work I can do. And I think that's a big mistake. Of course, it's important to be hireable. Of course, it's important to share your expertise, but it's also so important to be human too, not just hireable, but also human. So what's your advice to somebody who says, gosh, you know, Linda, you've 
you've got this big network. I've got sort. I've got one one hundred that sounds like of what you've got. But I hesitate. Say somebody's hesitating to talk about non-work kind of things or non-content kind of ways. What would you tell them? Well, first you have to be yourself. But I would say start with something that's relatable. If you're out to lunch and we're all eating outside, I guess now because of COVID. Uh, talk about the weather. Uh, just start a conversation, but don't lead with, I'm the best engineer. I can do this for you. It is, it's, it's a super big turnoff. You, you have to build some relationship. If it's on the phone, if it's on video, start with something that's relatable, something in the news, something that happened to you that day. You were out walking the dog. I don't have a dog, but I'm, I'll try to relate. Uh, you were out walking the dog and the neighbor came by and said, did you see the patch of ice? Over you? There's, there's got to be something that, that you feel. It's got to come from in here that you can, that you can break the ice with. I love that. And with the science behind it, a lot of, some of our audience knows, some of it doesn't, but tons of science that says we say yes to people we like more often and that we do business with people we like. And the number one correlation by a bunch of research out of Santa Clara University is that um, the number one correlation to likability is commonality. And that's what you're talking about. Find something in common. It can be that you both took a break yesterday because it was 79 degrees for on a sunny day and you talked about that walk in the park, or it could be something really deep and meaningful, a cause that they believe in that you happen to believe in too, that you're able to notice on LinkedIn or Twitter or social media that you can bring up. So these can be small, these can be life-changing, but but commonality is huge. So how do you, um, so say you're in that first five minutes of the conversation, you're you're eating outdoors, the, the we're, we're starting to get back to normal and the pandemic, and you're, you're sort of having this sort of human conversation what kind of things are you doing very practical to find commonality? How, how do you do it? That is a very difficult thing to teach because the, every conversation is going to be different. Every interaction you have is going to be different. Yep. But by starting at the we're all enjoying the same weather kind of conversation, usually the person you're talking with gives you the clue and then yep. you take it to the next level. So yeah, the weather was great, but I had to miss it because my kid got the chicken pox and we had to go to the doctor. Oh, I, I, I had the chicken pox. It was horrible. I missed clock arithmetic in second grade because we, we, I, I my, my parents had to make a, a little paper plate pie clock. I mean, whatever it is. And also I think I'll relate to you some that when I just told the story, I gave you a lot of detail and, or the story about my grandfather's grocery store, which I really didn't even think we would wind up talking about today because I, I, when I talk about it, it's usually when I talk to young lawyers about why I became a lawyer, but I put detail in the story because the, the detail interests me, but also I think it's interesting to other people. Yeah, and if it boils down to these two things, offering detail through story of what you're doing, what you're about to do, the holiday you're going on in three weeks. We don't want to say, I'm going on vacation in three weeks. We want to share what we're doing, what we're looking forward to. And so offering detail, and then I know you're really good at this because I've seen you do it, asking for detail. So if somebody says they're going on holiday in three weeks, say, hey, where are you going? Well, asking for those details we're by offering details and asking for details, we're just going to stumble into commonality at some point. Yeah. Your thoughts. I, I want to take this in a slightly different direction because commonality is critical, but diverse people in, in the various professions have struggled for years with feeling like they're not part of the, the team. They're not, they don't have these common, uh, relationships. And it's extremely important for leaders in organizations to make sure that the diverse members of your team feel welcome and are welcome. And if you are a diverse person going into a business development meeting, 
there are lots of areas of commonality. Don't, don't be nervous or frightened about it. Think it through, take a deep breath because we're all human beings. And candidly, it's a lot easier than it was when I was the only woman in the room <laughs> that that was, I was the only woman in the law firm, all of those things. Uh, I remember once having a woman client that called my boss and said, are you sure I should have a woman lawyer? <laughs> so it, it, you, you have, everybody has uh, things that hold them back, either up in here or in the real world. Everything can be conquered. Just march forward. There, the answer is there, and it always comes from being yourself. Linda, I, I can't, I, a lot of times I'll synthesize an episode that was a mic drop moment. I'm not going to do it. That's the end. You crushed it. <laughs> People are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to want to. They want to say thank you for this inspirational message. They might. You handle such a broad base of of matters at Baker Donaldson, and you assemble teams around you to help. You can almost tackle anything. Um, where should people go to say thank you for this episode or to inquire about your legal services? What do you say? I'm always interested in meeting new people. And so LinkedIn is a good way to find me. Uh, my email address is a good way to find me. So either way, I look forward to hearing from everyone. Perfect. And then just in case somebody's barreling down the highway, what is your email address? Go ahead and say it and we'll put it in. Not the show so easy. Yeah. It's L Klein and Klein is spelled K-L-E-I-N, L Klein at Baker Donaldson, D-O-N-E-L-S-O-N.com. Perfect. L Klein at Baker Donaldson.com is D-O-N-E-L. E-L-S-O-N. We'll put that in the show notes, everybody. Linda is a gem of a person. She's a trailblazer. She will help you in any way she can. She's, I can't even, can't even start to describe the number of people you've helped, Linda. And now you've helped all the listeners of our, our show. So thanks for being on the show. Everybody, hey, follow, subscribe, the podcast, the show, whatever one of the almost 30 platforms you're on, set up those notifications. This was great. And we've got four more episodes with Linda coming up next. Thanks, Linda. Hey everybody, Mo Bunnell here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. Man, if you didn't catch the episode before this one with Linda Klein, who is senior managing shareholder at Baker Donaldson, she's also past president of the ABA, first woman president of the Georgia Bar, legendary lawyer. Uh, if you didn't catch the last episode, you've got to listen to it and stick around to the end because there's some inspiring uh, comments by Linda at the very end. It's one of our best ever. Okay, Linda, in this episode, I'd love to hear, and your the audience would love to hear, what's your personal definition of business development? Adding value to a client's business by solving the problem. Uh, lawyers tend to look at clients' problems as legal issues. And I think that's true in any professional service. You know, they say that, that the carpenter looks at everything like a hammer and a nail. Yep. Uh, and, and looking at a client's problem as a legal issue, that's really great when you're in law school. That's really great when you're sitting in continuing education. That is not a way to develop business. Clients know you're smart. You don't have to show that off, and please don't. Uh, I see it all the time in professional service pitches, not just lawyers. Uh, everybody is so anxious to say, uh, about all the, all the great things that they do and did and how they were Phi Beta, whatever, and all that. And clients just want their problem solved. So people who buy professional services like legal services, they're really sophisticated. And sellers of professional services in general show up with that glossy stuff and the, the free ear pods bearing the company name and, and all these branded giveaways. And I managed a law office for a long time and lots of people came to see me. And I didn't like when people were hard selling me. And I personally hope that I never do that. I certainly never want to do that. Uh, I don't like when people are pretending like they aren't hard selling me, but they really are. Like they tell me that they're here to help, but they keep asking for the sale before they've solved the problem. Uh, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but, um, there was someone that was trying to bring me this client gift that they wanted me to buy in volumes to give all of my clients. And I had just this reaction to the 
thing. It was just stupid. And, it, and I, I wasn't going to buy it. And in the nicest way, I said, this is really not something that would appeal to my clients. And just kept asking for, well, maybe there's just a few clients who would like it. It, it, it was, I was, I, I felt very uncomfortable. And the person who kept, you know, well, if, if I can't say 100, can I say you 50? What about 25? What about 10? What about five and a half? I, it, it was, what if I cut the price? And it, it, I, I just, I, I felt awful. I, yeah. I felt awful for the person. And then I just was like, how can I get out of this room? So what I think I can do best and what I love to do is to find new ways to solve problems. Yes. And by listening carefully, I look for ways, an example is to bring down the cost of dispute resolution. I look for ways to take a client who has the same problem over and over again and try to get the root or try to manage it so it doesn't pull all of the business leaders' time away from growing their business. Um, problems that require you to hire a licensed professional, like legal problems, are very distracting. And I said professional, licensed professional, because if you need a plumber or, or a surgeon, you have a distracting problem. But, but sometimes I see a situation that I can't solve with my experience. And if I can't help, do I know who can? Maybe there's another lawyer. Is the problem really a legal problem that requires a lawyer to solve it? Is there technology available? Could we divide up or disaggregate the problem and assign pieces to others? Um, an example. Uh, a client was interested in contract management software because in their business, they had lots and lots of contracts. And the client thought that the problem was a legal problem. But in listening, I realized it was a process problem. And then they had to get organizational buy-in in the whole company to adopt it. Uh, an example, consumer lawsuits where uh, a company manufactures something and they get sued a lot over the, uh, over the product. Well, you might not be able to redesign the product, so we have to control this this litigation that happens all the time. Could we train lower level people in the organization and empower them to solve the problem rather than wait for it to become a lawsuit? Those are some examples. Well, I, I absolutely love this. And of course, you know, our, our, our give to get kind of idea where you actually start solving the problem sometimes if, if you need to, uh, to develop the relationship, to show your expertise, actually solving the problem. And, but you box that into a, you know, a 30 minute call or hour call or whatever. And it's clear at some point the client will need to hire you to, if, if they need your personal help or your, or your firm's help. But so many professionals are resistant to start solving the problem because they feel like, well, they should get paid right out of the gate or uh, they don't feel comfortable giving first or whatever. And you flip that on your head. Of course, it's what we believe, too, which which is if you just are trying to authentically be helpful, as opposed to in like your example, that that poor product salesperson, you know, selling and pushing something on you, man, we we all sense that we we love, we hate to be sold to, we love to buy as humans. We sense that being sold to thing right away and we want to run. But when somebody starts solving their problems, reciprocity gets in, we're learning, we're enjoying the experience. We want to grab their big brain even more. So drop us into, um, I loved your examples. They're just so good. Drop us into, you, you've met somebody, um, there's clearly some, business issues that have a, have some legal um, perspectives to them. What are you looking to do in a first meeting to, to start solving? What, what's your mindset? I think just talking about what your mindset going into initial meeting would be, would be helpful to the audience. The first thing is don't go into the meeting expecting that the only win is to come out with business. Yes. In fact, strike that from your brain. Don't go into the first meeting ex expecting business to come out of it. Go into the first meeting to get to know somebody. And if you do that, I think you'll just relax. Just you're meeting a friend 
you're at, it's freshman year of college and you're in the dining hall and you don't know anybody and you sit down at the table and you're just introducing yourself. Just start a, start a relationship. And that, that I think is exactly how uh, you should approach every one of these meetings. Yeah, when I was working with a, with a client in a professional service firm just, just earlier this week, and she had a, what she called a major unlock. Uh, she had been looking at business development as sales, and she, her words were quite literally, I hate this and I don't want to do it. And when we reframed things to like initial meetings, it's just treat that person like it was a friend of yours and they called and they, and they, they knew you're a lawyer in, in this case, and they, and they wanted to just get your advice on something. How would you treat them? She's like, wow, I would, you know, take the call on a Saturday. I would look for ways to be helpful. I said, well, just let's just approach all of your meetings that way. And uh, she had a meeting and she happened, it's a longer story, but I'll, but she found a way to be helpful. And she, in the, and she was just super pleased because she added a lot of value to that person because there was something she could be helpful with. And she just, the reframing of, I'm not here to sell. I, I didn't need to treat this person like a friend was a big unlock. Your thoughts? So nothing makes me prouder than when I can help clients in their success. Yeah. And it's also true that nothing makes me prouder when I can help my colleagues in their success. So when I'm able to help someone achieve their goals, I feel great. Yeah. And that's exactly the feeling that, that your client had. So let's, let's dig in a little deeper, deeper. Our, our, our audience has always said practicality is really helpful. So, you know, you've, you've talked about mindset, getting to know someone, have meeting a friend, having that metaphor of we're freshmen in the dining hall and we're just, just meeting people. When you're thinking about follow-up, so, so you've met somebody, um, they have a business issue that has a legal angle to it, you could be helpful. Um, you had a great meeting. You were going to say introducing the somebody at Baker Donaldson, amazing firm. What, you know, two weeks later, three weeks later, and you're thinking about follow-up, how do you think about reaching out to that person afterwards? Well, remember that I've listened carefully. So maybe it's just uh, trying to find ways to connect th uh, them with someone else. Maybe it's not even someone else that helps them with their business. Maybe in the course of the conversation, I learned that a friend or someone else in their business in, in another city is going to relocate to Atlanta, where I live. Uh, maybe it's a it's a, a friend that's in a, a totally different industry. Hey, so and so, my friend here in Baltimore is moving to Atlanta. Well, uh, I'm all over that. First of all, I want to do it, uh, and I'm delighted to introduce introduce the new person around. So. Uh, to put me in touch with your friend. Usually that's an email happens quickly and we'll go ahead and, and get started. Where are you moving to? Uh, what are you going to be doing? And by, by the way, by that time, you might have two clients. Yeah. I love it. You get a twofer with a, with something like that. And I think the key to your point with this, that the, the, what I, the words I wrote down were listen carefully. That's it. Um, so let me go deeper on that. Super practical again. How do you, like Linda, you know so many people, you know, past president of the, of the American Bar Association, first one president, woman president of the Georgia Bar. You're involved in so many different community activities with, uh, I couldn't even want to get started because there's so many. How do you make these connections? How do you remember that so-and-so has moved to Atlanta and they might want to meet so-and-so? Like how, how do you keep track of it all? Uh, well, I guess I'm the phone a friend on business development. <laughs> so I don't know if people remember that TV show, yeah. but the whole idea was that you were in a, in a, on a game show and you had an opportunity to phone a friend if you didn't know the answer. So when I, the, an email goes around and says, I need a left-handed plumber in Minot, uh, North Dakota, uh, I'm usually the one that answers that. Uh, do I, how do I remember it? I don't have any special device, I'm sorry, but I suspect that if, if people use a, a tool that you have given them that I'm embarrassed to say I've never used, 
um, where you've got the big sheet and you write down all the people you know. Uh, I think that's exactly what, what people could do. Um, I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that. Um, but before I do, I want to say that if you have taken your time to know the industry that this potential customer is in, you're going to know the pain points. So number one, know the industry. And if you can help, but only if you can help, offer to help. Don't offer to help if you really can't help because then that's going to look bad. Um, and if you can't help, just be a friend until you can help. Yeah, I love that. Well, and I want to, I will respond to your, your tee up is, well, I think what's interesting is like when, when you went through Grow Big Training, you were already at a 99.9999 percentile rainmaker. <laughs> so I want to say this to the audience, Linda can skip over writing down her core co co contacts names because you're so fluent in keeping in touch with so many people. I'm, I'm dead serious. You're already at the top of the, uh, uh, you know, if there's a normal curve, you're way out to one side of, of the proficiency of fluency. But what somebody can do if you're listening to the show and you want to get to where Linda is now, the number one thing you want to do right out of the gate is just write down your most important relationships. Keep it to five or 10 people. It does. You don't have to boil the ocean. You might know th hundreds, thousands of people, but if you try to keep in touch with the, the level of folks that Linda keeps in touch with, you'll fail right out of the gate because it's, it's too big. You, you'll quit before you begin. So what you do, we call this a protomoy list. It's a word that means first among equals. You can do it on a scrap piece of paper. You can read chapter four of the Snowball System. There's tools that downloadable that they reference that come with the book. But the core nut of it is just write down the top five to 10 people, this is important, that are important to your future success. They may be people you know well now, they may not be, but that's where you're gonna steer your efforts of helpfulness is to your high priority. Linda, Linda does this with hunt thousands of people, people, Linda, but that is a very high bar. That's like you're learning a sport and, you, and you're trying to compare yourself to a gold medal Olympic, Olympic athlete. That Don't do that. You don't go to Linda right away. Linda level, um, but just start small and then you scale up from that. So Linda, your, your cool. thoughts on that as we wrap up? Uh, that, that, was, that was absolutely great advice. So your number one takeaway people out there in listener land is what Mo just told you because he knows he's the best. I love it. Well, we, I want to coin a phrase, um, the best of the best from now on, we're going to call Linda level. It uses alliteration. It's true. <laughs> so from now on, I'll say, hey, don't go to Linda level right out of the gate. Just go to level one. That's way out here. <laughs> well, Linda, thanks for being on the show. Everything is just so meaningful and thoughtful and, and poignant. Um, where should people go if they want to say thank you for the inspiration you've provided, if they want to maybe even inquire about you helping with a, with a legal issue? Well, I'm always delighted to meet new people. And LinkedIn is a good way to reach me. Uh, email is a good way to reach me. Uh, lkline at bakerdonaldson.com is my email address. And I look forward to any friend of Mo's is a friend of mine. I love it. Well, everybody, we'll put those down in the show notes. So if you're in transit and you can't write those down, just check in the show notes later. But if you do want to just type it, uh, write it down verbally, it's L Klein, K L E I N, at Baker Donaldson and Donaldson.com. And Donaldson is D O N E L S O N. Linda, thanks for being on the show. Everybody, follow, subscribe, set up those not notifications so your phone goes off like crazy because we've got three more episodes coming up. And we're going to teach you Linda level in every one of these three. Linda, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Hey everybody, Mo Bundle here. I'm just having a blast with Linda Klein. You can like feel the energy. If you haven't, if you, if you haven't listened or watched the last two episodes, go back because Linda Klein, who is? Senior Managing Shareholder at Baker Donaldson. She was the first woman president of the Georgia Bar. She was president of the National American Bar Association. Uh, just a change agent in every sense of the words. Um, Linda covered some very specific things, how she thinks about growth, what her definition of business development is from a practical perspective, how she follows up with people, if she thinks about first time meetings, really good stuff in the last two episodes. In this one, Linda, I can't wait to hear 
what's your favorite science step or story when it comes to grow big training or the snowball system? It was hard to pick one. Uh, I, when I was thinking about this, uh, I remember that I was privileged to be invited to your book launch party when yeah. you launched the snowball system. And I remember the drinks were in those plastic cups and you need to know that I have saved my snowball system plastic cup. It is prominent in the kitchen. And so it, every day when I open the, the cabinet with the cups, there it is. And what does it do? It reminds me that I need to be channeling Mo. <laughs> so it's, it's very important, everyone out there. If, if you don't have the cup, then take the book and put it somewhere where you'll see it every day so that you will channel Mo every day. Well, you gave um, me goosebumps on that. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> folks, if you want a plastic cup, I'm a little afraid to say this because we have a pretty big audience, but I do have a couple around. And if you're a really great friend, I can send you a cup. <laughs> oh, I should have brought it to show it off like Vanna White, but I, sorry. Um, I, I didn't know we were going to have to have this conversation. Uh, but I'm going to pick something from Grow Big Training. Okay. And okay. I'm going to bet that I'm the first one to choose it. Ooh, I uh, like and it. All, and You've that is some curiosity. Yeah, go ahead. Dynamic meeting planning. Oh, I love it. Go deeper. I never like to feel unprepared in my work. I never want to be asked a question by a judge in court when I don't know the answer. And the same is absolutely true for meeting a new client. Uh, let's say you're meeting with a construction industry potential client to discuss a problem involving their business. You need to know the language the industry uses. Yeah. A sub is a subcontractor, not a substitute teacher. Uh, PSI is used to measure concrete strength. That's pounds per square foot. In financial services, you need to know things like EBITDA. Uh, th these, are, these are the important, the important language of of the potential client's business. So with you, Mo, there's a funnel in every module. <laughs> and the one here is starting at the broad top of the funnel, which is research the industry. Yep. Next, research the company. Yep. And then research on the prospect. Yep. Now, hopefully we all have someone who can help us do this research, but there's always Google. And it's amazing how much companies have on their website. They may give you their goals. And, and of course, you've got all their press releases. And it strikes me to say that more and more professional services are being sold by teams to teams. Yes. And if, and if you're lucky, you have someone at the company who's going to spend time with you in advance, answering questions to make you better prepared. And that's going to include some insights into the team that you're going to meet with. That call, if you can have it, or pre-meeting with someone inside the organization is huge. Uh, that's going to help you build the team that goes to the meeting. And, and by the way, preparing for the meeting pays even more dividends when you actually get the work because you have an enormous head start. I'll pause there before we go to the four quadrant approach. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I want to go. I want to go deeper on this, and I'll tell you, it's interesting because it, in, as people go through Grover training, the the consistent feedback we get around dynamic meeting prep because it's a roll up of so many other skills that that feed into it. How do you ask great questions? How do you overcome objections? How do you deepen the relationship using the four quadrants? All those kind of things. The common feedback we usually get is, "Oh my gosh." my firm, my organization, my, my company, we almost always prepare for delivery meetings. You know, oh my gosh, we got the meeting next Tuesday. It's the readout of our initial analysis, whatever. We all got to get ready. Everybody does that. But for some reason, for business development meetings, people either don't prep at all or they text each other right before or whatever. So what if, what if I have a feeling you are always preparing well, but as, you, as you've looked at your teams, you manage, if you helped other prepare on those three levels you mentioned, What's going on in the industry? What's going on in the company? What's going on with the actual human beings that we're, we're going to meet with? What have, it, what have been the before and after that you've seen as people prepare more? Well, uh, the, the first thing is, is the more prepared you are, 
when you get the business, the work is going to be much easier to do. Yep. Um, but if you're asking me to contrast a prepared versus an unprepared meeting, yep. Um, an example, uh, everybody gets together the night before the pitch and they're all having dinner in a foreign city. Uh, somebody wants to go to the hotel room and watch a, a movie and somebody is really thinking that they'd be better served by leaving the company and they really don't want to be on this pitch. Uh, somebody else there is missing their kid's soccer game. You can't prepare for the meeting, the very first meeting at dinner at a restaurant where you're going to eat too much food uh, and think that you're going to be able to get prepared. So you have to start preparing well in advance. And that research that gets done, especially if you have help, you need to have the research and you need to know the research and everybody who's coming to that night before dinner, you should be done. You should be ready. That mm -hmm. dinner should almost be like a celebration that you're ready for the next day. So don't, don't, sh don't show up and not be prepared. Um, that, that, and that's the contrast because candidly, too many people do that. Yeah, they're distracted in the office. I know we've got the meeting and, oh, when well, we were going to have a, a, a pre-meeting, but I have something billable to do or uh, I want to go out because it's a nice day. And there's always an excuse to cancel the prep meeting. Don't do that. Yes. I, I, I don't know what else to say. Just don't do that. Yeah, make it a priority. Get, make, do the meeting with the team. Decide, oh, Sammy, you're going to talk about this because that's what you're really good at. Uh, and Susie, you're going to do that. And it would be really good if you let me introduce you so I can tell them about you. Don't, don't brag on yourself. Let me do that for you. There are all the little things that need to be done that you don't want to have an awkward, well, uh, well uh, I'll just introduce myself. It's just horrible. Yeah. I love and it this. also makes your team look like they don't know how to work together. Exactly. The, the team needs to show the client that they are seamless, that they're used to working together, that they like each other, that they like working together, and they love solving problems for their clients together. Yes. And I'll, and I'll just share with everybody just some pro, sort of pro ninja tips on this. If there, there's a whole... But there's a half a chapter in Snowball System all about this. There's a form you can download that comes with the book. Obviously, it's part of the Grow Big training, like you said, Linda, as well, where we guide people through it with, a, with an actual facilitator. But the, but the major steps are figure out what's your goal for the meeting, how far can you actually come, how far can you go. Two is what's the frame? How do you kick off the meeting, preferably beforehand, or, and then also in the first couple minutes, first five minutes, to say, Hey, we think we can accomplish X. How does that sound to you? If they tweak it, great. They're buying in. If they say, that's exactly it. Great. You've shown that you've done your homework. Then we get into some things like, what are the big questions we want to ask? What are the objections we might hear and how do we overcome that? What's the order that we'll go through in the meeting and who's going to own each piece? Um, who should even sit next to whom on the Zoom screen or in person based on thinking preferences? How, how, oh, and then what's our, what's our natural next steps? Potentially, what's a cliffhanger? What's a thing we can suggest at the end of this meeting that would incentivize and make people really excited about meeting with us again? So there's like, there's a process to this. I say to this to the audience, Linda, you already know that, but there's a process to this and there's forms that come in the snowball system or grow big training that help with that. So yeah, uh, go. I, 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 I want to just react to a few things you said. And I think your point about having one goal should be obvious, but I will sign an affidavit that it is very easy to get distracted. Oh, yes. hundred <laughs> percent. And, and that is, that's actually the hardest part, I think. Yes. Uh, well, maybe the hardest part for me personally is to be direct about the purpose of the meeting. That, yeah. that might be the hardest part because that's a, that, that, that it requires you to get a little courage down there. Um, so I, I think maybe when I ask you a question, why don't you help us with that one about being direct about the purpose of the meeting? How do you gather the courage for that one?
Yeah, well, that that thank you. I'm not going to go too long because remember, you're the interviewee, although I, I see what you're doing. <laughs> oh, and I just thought of another story, too. Good. So. <laughs> well, well I'll, I'll answer quickly then and we'll get back to the, the story. But this is really rich, folks. Um, because your prep is going to is going to determine how the client feels about you, and it's all in the prep. So, so the idea of how to gather that courage to 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 frame up the meeting appropriately. I'll give you an example. Um, if your goal in the in a first meeting is to find follow up, like Linda, you mentioned this so well in the prior two episodes. Everybody, go back and watch or listen to those. Your goal when you meet somebody is develop a relationship, not to sell something, to potentially find some ways to follow up. And it's so authentic the way you do that. So back to the talking to the audience, what you might say in the beginning of a meeting, say you're, you're meeting for lunch, you've met a potential prospect for the first time, it's light and breezy, there's just two of you. You might say very informally in this case, because you're at lunch and it's outdoors and things like that, you might say, hey, uh, Jane, I'm so glad that Sue introduced us. Um, I'm really interested in learning about what priorities you've got in this meeting and just to get to know you. So over the next months and years, I can find ways to be helpful. Let me be clear. You've, you've probably been to meetings like this where somebody tries to jam their services <laughs> down their throat or sell. You can just make fun of it. Um, I'm not going to do that. I really want to hear what's going on in the business. You're in manufacturing. I have a, I've done a lot of work with manufacturing companies. And I just love to learn from you about what priorities you've got going on. If there happens to be some ways we can follow up um, legally or just as a friend, that's what I'm looking for to do. Does that, does that sound like a, a, a fun talk for today? So just I think being authentic about it is the way to go, because I think if you skip over it and you just start talking about other stuff, they're sitting there using a lot of their cognitive brain power thinking, what are we doing again? And is this person going to sell to me? And what's this going to be like? So I think it's just so powerful to right out of the gate, be authentic. And that's why I don't bring a PowerPoint unless I'm yes. specifically asked to do so. Yes. I don't bring a glossy brochure unless I'm specifically asked to bring bios of the team. Yes. But that doesn't mean I don't think about the agenda. Yes. But but you have to, to be ready to discuss what they want to discuss. I mean, I can't tell you how many times you have an hour set for the meeting. They walk in, they tell you they have 20 minutes because, and you were expecting to see Mr. X and Ms. Y and Ms. Z, but instead yes. they're called out of town. Someone else covers the meeting. You're called to talk about A, but in the morning something happened like their biggest customer filed bankruptcy and that's all that's on their mind. Blah, 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 blah. So the more prepared you are, yes. the easier it's going to be to switch gears, to pivot, and the easier it's going to be to answer the tough questions because you've considered them in advance. Bingo, and that's everybody, that, that's a part on the form is how do you handle if you get half the time, double the time? How do you handle it if different people show up? So planning for those situations, like an athlete would prepare for all the different, de they're an offense on their sports team and planning for all the different defenses that might occur, planning for those crazy things, that's how what's gonna make you feel comfortable. So Linda, you said, okay, my curiosity is going crazy. You said you had a story to tell. It, let's end this episode with a story. Go. Oh, well, it's it. I hope we have enough time. So uh, I'll tell the story. And if there's no time, I guess you can edit no, it we're, out. You, you've got us hooked. Go for it. When I was in, I think, seventh grade, uh, I won the school science fair. And that meant that on a rainy, cold night, my father had to drive me across the county after dinner to compete in the county science fair and you know, the poor man he worked all day and he had to take and and we we were driving and and and, and i did my thing and it, it, it and i i think i may even have won or at least i got honorable mention and on the way back we had the most incredible conversation that a little girl and her father could have and he was a a builder and he could build anything, and, and I always admired that. And he was teaching me about something that I never understood, at the, that I didn't understand at the time. And he said, if you have a strong base and a solid plank, you can move anything. And he was in the construction business, but I think he knew that I was not going to become a builder because he said, and that works for ideas too. Hmm. And if you go into the meeting with the strong base and the solid plank, you'll be able to move anything. This is 
You're, you're just dropping the mic again, Linda. I, I'm not synthesizing anything in this episode. That's the end. People are going to want to reach out and say thank you for that advice. They're going to want to see if potentially some people are going to want to see if you can help them with legal matters. Linda, that story was awesome. Where should they go if they want to say thank you for this? I'm always glad to meet new people. So uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn or on email, lkline at bakerdonaldson.com. I look forward to talking to you. Oh, thank you. And everybody, uh, Klein is K-L-E-I-N. Donaldson is at bakerdonaldson.com is D-O-N-E-L-S-O-N, the big law firm. Linda, you inspire me every time we talk. This has just been so good. I can't wait for the next two episodes. Everybody, follow. you know I have to say it, follow, subscribe, set up your notifications. But the benefit of you following the show is you get two more bites at the apple of Linda's big mind. So those are coming up next. Linda, thank you. Thank you. Hey everybody, it's it's Mo Bunnell, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm grinning again from ear to ear because Linda and I were just talking in between episodes. Just we need to see each other more. And we're like getting all these wins because we're hopefully creating some great content for you. But we're enjoying uh, just just spending time with each other, too. So, OK, we have recorded three amazing episodes. People, if you if audience, if you haven't watched them, they're all, they're all three, the ones right before this one. They are so darn good, where Linda talks about how she de deepens relationships very practically, how she thinks about first-time meetings. The last episode, how she personally prepares for client meetings so that you have the confidence, highest chance of success, such good stuff. This fourth episode in this season is, is one of my favorite ones. It's a little more storytelling. The goal of this episode is to be inspiring. And Linda, you, you've inspired even when you haven't been trying, so I can't even wait to see where this goes. But, I, but I, I, I know you never talk about yourself, but I need you to for our audience. And I want you to share a business development or relationship development story that you're particularly proud of. Many, 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 many years ago, I did a favor for an accountant. I didn't send him a bill. And it obviously made a difference to him, but honestly, I just forgot about it. And I barely remembered the person. And I definitely didn't remember uh, and still don't remember. I do not remember what I did to help him. A long time passed. I don't even remember how many years passed, but it was more than five. It may have been 10. One day, the phone rang. It was that accountant. And he had retired years earlier. So he certainly wouldn't be in a position to, to send me business at this point, but he was volunteering at a nonprofit where people who have business savvy, uh, help budding entrepreneurs start their business. And the call went something like this. Hi, Linda, this is John Jones. Do you remember me? Uh, uh well, bef thank goodness before I could answer him, he reminded me about who he was and what I did for him and how much it meant to him. And he told me that he had retired. It's great, John. I hope you're enjoying yourself and your grandchildren or whatever. And then he told me he was volunteering. And I expected he was going to ask me to help the group, to make a speech. And, and by the way, he did do that at a later date. And I was happy to help. But the purpose of the call was to tell me, and, and this is just about a quote, Everyone I meet asking for help there is a loser with a capital L, except this guy. And he needs a lawyer. Are you taking new clients? And the client was in an industry that I had to learn. The client sold niche products in a very mature industry, very tough business for most mature companies. But it turned out that the guy was a genius and knowing what to sell and how to make the product. Because if you would have asked me, this guy wasn't, couldn't possibly make it. He's starting out, it's a niche product, the industry's mature, there's a lot of competition from very successful mature companies. Well, I incorporated him, I helped get him started, and within nine months, nine months, he was the biggest client of our firm. Wow. I think you wanted me to tell you what I was most proud of. Yeah. So, and, yeah. So keep going oh, in that story. Let me actually say it. So the audience knows okay. where we're headed is 
what and I'll and I'll just like let ever let the audience peek behind the curtain. When somebody shares a story they're proud of, and you and by the way, folks, you can ask somebody this at a client at dinner, whatever. It's amazing couple step process. Share a story you're proud of, and then say, "What gosh, what did you personally do that makes you so proud?" And I got this from a good friend, Luke Burgess, who's written a book called Wanting, and he's just a genius. Um, highly recommend the book Wanting, love it. So, so back to you, Linda. W what are you personally most proud of in that story? That I made a difference in two people's lives. Mm. For the client, I helped him achieve his dream. Uh, I helped him start and grow a business. And by the way, it is still very successful. And it's providing for the next generation of his family and maybe even the one after that. Now, for the retired guy, he never forgot what I did to help him. I forgot, but he didn't forget. And it shows that investing in other people is always worthwhile. Uh, I think we said this in another episode, um, but I created an entire business development career over volunteering. And while my practice involves helping business people uh, uh, make their businesses run better, I, I like sharing our community endeavors to make things better. I like helping them solve their business problems. We solve problems and community problems together. And more importantly, we prevent problems from happening both in their business and in the community. Uh, that's what professionals do. And that's what I love to do. I love it. It, it reminds me, I, I was just on a Zoom call with some really high-end management consultants, global organization. Most of, It was early this morning on Eastern time where we're both because they, they, most of the folks were in Asia. Um, but some folks were really struggling with, I like this idea of helping people because that was a big theme. Like uh, you told us better story than I did. I should have you attend some of these calls. But uh, they liked the idea of helping, but the, but the barrier was, oh, but I'm so busy. So how do you handle that, Linda? Because you're one of the busiest. I mean, you, you, you do so many things. How do you handle the helping with the demands of billable time and, and delivery and the contracts need to be done by December 31st and all that kind of thing? The truth is, is it's not hard if you spread it out over seven days. <laughs> uh, do I have a lot of free time? No. But the things that I do as a volunteer are the most rewarding things that I do. So it's just, to me, that's like being on vacation because I you know, only do what you love. Uh, and Mo will tell you that all the time. You, you've, gotta, you've gotta do what you love. And so if you do what you love, you're going to enjoy it. You'll meet new friends. I mean, it's not a chore to be part of your community. Well, if it is a chore to you, then don't do that. Yeah. But to me, it's not a chore to be part of my community. That's when I moved to Atlanta, I didn't know anyone. And the way I made friends was to become involved. I became involved in the bar association. I became involved in, in community activities. That's how I made friends. Yeah. And there's a, I love that because you do an amazing job of not only being involved in groups where you go to one event and you get a see and impact and learn from and stay connected with a dozen people, 120 people, 1200, whatever the, whatever the frame is or the event is, but you also do an amazing job of one-on-one -on -one contact, you know, Hey, I want to uh, introduce you to somebody or, Hey, I, I wrote this article and in uh, law practice management management thought you might want it, or uh, here's a helpful, I don't know if you saw what happened in the appellate courts, but this is something that you might be interested in. How do you juggle the difference or how do you think about the difference between sort of getting involved in groups where you get a lot of scale and then also managing sort of that one-to-one, -one, that thoughtful, more personal outreach? I think for the latter, you just have to be curious. Uh, a, a lawyer once said to me, the only marketing I do is I read the newspaper. <clears throat> and then after I read the newspaper, I just call the people who are involved. Yeah. And yeah. At the time, he I think he was from a, a town that's now a big town that wasn't such a big town at the time. And sure enough, if he saw something involving the big bank, he'd call the president of the bank and chances are they might know, know them. But uh, I remember that uh, I saw that uh, a large client of mine 
uh, they, they were not using us in a particular area of the law. And I read in the newspaper, literally read in the newspaper that something involving their company in another area of the law was going on. I sent an email and within 24 hours, we were doing all of their work in that area of the law and nobody else bothered they I mean, a giant company with all those law firms no one read the newspaper i'm the only one who read the newspaper the answer is yeah wow so if you're curious and you read periodicals and stay informed i mean nowadays people i don't think are as informed i mean there was a time when everybody took the local newspaper i don't think that happens anymore um so another thing i do i read the obituaries um, it sounds creepy, but, and there was a time where we might have the person's will in our will file. But the point was, is I often see that someone I know has had a loss and I reach out to them. I think what's interesting about if, if we call it Linda level to everybody, like this is the top of the heap, <laughs> you do an amazing job. And I want to break this down into, into, uh, manageable chunks for folks. Cause it might seem like too much. But just getting involved in your community in some way, to your point, Linda, that you're actually passionate about. It doesn't feel like a chore, but it gives you energy because you believe in the cause or whatever. That's interesting because it gives you scale. The organization already exists. There's already meetings. There's already committees. You can get involved and use the mechanism that already exists to get to meet new people. Um, and then secondarily, this idea of, uh, you know, and today setting up a Google alert, reading the reading the newspaper, finding uh, some way to alert yourself of things that are going on, and then reaching out with, with empathy, with something meaningful, something helpful. Those two things can be incredibly powerful. Uh, just your thoughts on just staying involved, staying top of mind, if you will. Do it. <laughs> it it's that simple. Find what you like and go do it. If you are a runner, get involved in the track club. If you are an environmentalist, get involved in one of the environmental charities. If your kids play soccer, get there are there are infinity number of opportunities. If you can't find one that interests you, then you're I don't believe it. Okay. I, <laughs> I, I, I just like that. I just don't believe it. Yeah, I like it. And what I love about your approach is you either of these things, you're showing your human first, you're bonding with the person first, you're developing the relationship first. And that's an incredible way to convert over to, to commercial results later because you're not worried about commercial results. It's the, it's the most ironic thing in the world. So let's close out this episode with your thoughts on that exact issue. I know we've talked about this before. I think when sometimes people can go to networking events or, or meeting somebody in their first the first goal is I need to sell something or I'm where I want to talk to them about what I do. If, if you start with that, it doesn't work. It doesn't land right. It just seems disingenuous. But if you start with not worrying about those things, but truly just trying to add value and be helpful, the actual financial results come when you're not worried about the financial results. So give us your, give us your take on that kind of concept. And I think that'll be the perfect close. You just reminded me of one quick story. Yes, uh, do it. Um, I was at a, uh, continuing education dinner. I found myself seated next to a general counsel of a very, very large company. Um, uh, I never, ever once talked about myself. I listened. I talked about some other people in our law firm uh, and how they handled certain problems. And a couple of months later, we got an opportunity to pitch against 50 other firms. Almost all of them had a prior relationship with the company. 15 were chosen and we were one of them. I love it. Isn't it neat and ironic and counterintuitive that the, the more the other person talks and the less you talk, the more people like us or the more, I should say it, not you. The, the more the other person talks, the less we talk, the more they like us. And how memorable is that, that you were able to fast track what other firms probably spent years to get to that sort of that last panel, that top 15, you were able to do in one conversation because of the way you handled it. That's just, it's, it's the perfect ending to this one. Um, and I'll say this one last thing. You had mentioned that you, you helped two people 
in that original story, I my guess is you helped dozens and dozens because not only did you help the person achieve their dreams, not only did you help the retired accountant, but you helped all these people at Baker Donaldson serve and do the best work that they could. And you know, when you start talking about a firm's biggest client, there were a lot of lawyers that were finding meaning in the work that they were doing too. So through one action, that little, that little favor you did an accountant years before, you were actually the, able to help dozens and dozens of people. And I think that's mm -hmm. super cool. So Linda, well, people- in, yeah. in full disclosure, um, that was the firm that I merged, we merged into Baker Donaldson. So it was before Baker Donaldson. Okay, so the, I get it. I get but it, it still was the biggest client of that firm. Yeah, I get it. So the denominator was a little bit bigger, but 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 still the impact, dozens and dozens and dozens of people. So Linda, people are going to want to reach out to you. They're going to want to say thank you, potentially even ask your advice on a legal issue or the business matter that has legal implications. How should they do that? Oh, I'd love to talk to anyone who has a question. Uh, LinkedIn is a good way to find me. Uh, email is a good way to find me, lkline at bakerdonaldson.com. Awesome. And we'll put those in the show notes, everybody. Hey, make sure you follow, subscribe to the show, set up those notifications. We got one more amazing episode with Linda coming up next. Hey, everybody. Mo Bunnell here, your host at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm almost sort of sad. This is our fifth and final episode with Linda Klein. I feel like I'm getting decades of knowledge in, in just four episodes that we already take. I always feel that way with you, Linda. Like if we have an hour lunch, I leave like floating on cloud nine driving home because I feel like I got 10 hours of awesome ideas. <laughs> I think our audience is going to feel the way, but this is our last one. So pretty cool question. I think for the last episode, you've had so much success. You're, you're a senior managing shareholder, at Baker Donaldson. You've handled some of the firm's biggest clients. You've run the firm. You've been the first woman president of the Georgia bar. You've been president of the national American bar association, pretty storied history. Of course, chambers rated all that other stuff. Um, your bio is like this long, but given that, if you looked back and if you could record a video to your younger self around business development, relationship development, the kind of stuff that we've talked about our last four episodes, what video would, what, what message would you send back to your younger self? Business development is about passion. Ooh. Life is about passion. Don't lose your passion for getting involved. Being part of the community is the price we pay for democracy. And helping others is the most satisfying thing you can do. Uh, temptation to stay at the office is great and it's really easy. And in so many ways, it's so much easier to make a dollar than to make a difference. But making the dollars is never gonna give you the fulfillment that comes from making a difference. You know, you can do both at the same time. And that's what I learned. I think, Mo, that might feel a little touchy-feely or esoteric. Uh, I think there are components to this. Uh, take the time to get good at what you do first, and then you have something to sell. And if you're passionate about what you do, you're going to get good at it. Um, think about how others will hear what you say. Uh, people can accept anything except being ignored. If you're going to say no, say no instead of avoiding the other person because it's much easier to just delete the email or not answer the phone with caller ID. And if you say no, please do it with kindness. Uh, there's a Maya Angelou quote that I just love. Uh, people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Treat people right. There's a story uh, that my grandfather taught me about treating people right that's in an earlier episode. Your words will evoke feelings in others. When So uh, what is a no that you're giving to someone today, that person could wind up being a future client of yours. And you want them to know that you treated them with respect and with kindness. Another thing I'd like to tell my younger self is to keep learning. Learn from others for sure, but be yourself. If you're passionate about what you do, 
you will be genuine. You'll always be genuine. Uh, you only have to look at mode and know what I mean, right? In every encounter with everyone he meets, he finds what he can learn from them. And he is passionate about helping you help others. That's, that's a, a great example. Um, I guess there's a caveat to this too, Mo. If you get so excited and so passionate, you won't listen to Mo, which means you won't plan. And then you're going to waste time. And that's bad. You should plan and you should follow your plan. However, this is where Mo's going to get mad at me. However, some of your best experiences will come from wasting time. In other words, if you rigidly plan, you might say no to something that will be an incredible opportunity. You will meet someone you otherwise might not have met. And they may become, as Mo would call it, your raging fan. Linda, I usually have follow-up questions, and I don't want to do that here. That, I can see, like, all the commencement speeches you've given, like, that was awesome. I just want to close it out. Um, that was so good. Where, where should people go to, to reach out to you, say thank you for this? I know it's going to be our shortest episode ever, but I'm going to mess it up if I keep going. So we're going to end. So <laughs> we're, it was that good. Where, where, where should people go to reach out to you to say thank you for this inspiration, to inquire about your advice, to talk to you? Well, in, since Mo didn't have a follow-up question, if anyone out there does, um, please reach out to me on LinkedIn or my email is lkline at bakerdonaldson.com. And we'll, and we'll put those in the show notes. Linda, I was looking forward to this so much. You, um, you, you've, in, you've inspired me for what all the things that you've done in your life, the trailblazing attitude that got, you've got, the, I can't imagine the headwinds that are against, were against you. Uh, being a woman in a profession that didn't have any women when you first started, uh, the fact that you were the first woman um, president of the, of the Georgia Bar, the fact that you were president of the ABA as the father of two women, I'm going to have my daughters watch this, all these episodes. And I just want to say uh, thank you for being on the show. Thank you.